Welcome to Dig, the History Podcast. The term intimate apparel came into use sometime around 1921. It immediately had a feminine association, evoking images of girdles, hose, brassiers, garters, bloomers, and slips, rather than knickers and trunks and undershirts or briefs. Prior to the 20th century, English speakers used varying terms which also had feminine associations. The term underwear dates to the 1870s and seems to have replaced the term undergarments, which came into use in the 1530s, but then fell out of fashion 350 years later. Underwear and undergarments referred almost always to intimate apparel for women. Underclothes, a term used only occasionally in the 19th century, was more likely to refer to garments meant for men. As the terminology implies, underwear was itself gendered. It also played an indispensable role in emphasizing sex difference and defining gender roles. Modern intimates, often called foundation garments, feminized women's bodies by accentuating the body parts most associated with womanliness and minimizing body parts that were, according to societal norms, unbecoming of a woman. For example, Corsets or girdles, which narrowed the waist and boosted the bosom, were most popular in times when societies were most concerned with defining gender roles. Corsets enjoyed universal appeal among women in the 19th century, when gender roles were rigorously enforced. They fell out of fashion briefly in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, when flappers, suave Hollywood stars, and a new generation of wartime working women earned notoriety and admiration by transgressing Victorian gender norms. After World War II, the corset craze was revived, peaking in the 1950s. For post-war societies, the corset sought to hearken back beyond the corsetless, gender-bendery of the previous decades to a simpler time when women knew their place and it was in the home as wife and mother. Underwear, the unseen garments which sit in close proximity to genitals, skin, and all sorts of unmentionable orifices, are the most poorly documented garments in history. Yet, they shaped bodies, minds, and societies in complex and interesting ways. Sometimes we do really tight analytical episodes, um, and this is not one of those episodes. Um, The history of underwear doesn't lend itself well to that kind of treatment. It's long, it's uneven, and it's extremely hard to get at because of poor documentation. So get ready for a wild and rambling adventure. Today we take on the global history of underwear from 3000 BCE to the 20th century. I'm Marissa Rhodes. And I'm Elizabeth garner Masrick, And we are your historians for this episode of DIG. We just want to let you know that there are some adult themes in this episode because we'll be talking about um, intimate wear and so sexuality and genitals and things like that all come up. So nothing raunchy or graphic, but um, definitely you might want to uh, have a listen first before you listen to this episode with your young children or something. So uh, just keep that in mind. Clothing has always had at least two purposes, a practical purpose firstly, but clothing has also had social function, usually as a means of class distinction. This two-pronged purpose actually delayed the development of undergarments. Only a few ancient societies have left us documentation about its clothing, ancient Egypt, Bronze Age Crete, classical Greece, and ancient Rome. In these societies, climates were mild and most people lived a subsistence lifestyle. Fabric was expensive and few people had the resources to purchase or make garments which did not have an immediately obvious function. 
For elites, habits of dress revolved around status, appearance, and messaging. Those who could afford such luxuries were status-motivated, but no one would see their underwear, so there was little point in wearing any. So in the ancient world, most people went without. Understanding this part of historical people's lives is made even more difficult by the fact that we have no way of knowing the prevalence of undergarments because even if they were common, they weren't regarded as important and therefore their construction and function were never recorded for posterity. We think that most underwear evolved gradually and that they started as outer garments. So you'll have to bear with me here because I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just some outer garments first. As modes of dress became increasingly complex, people began adding additional layers of clothing. Outer layers became more elaborate over time, but initial layers remained simple and functional because, once again, no one's going to see them or talk about them. This process happened at different times in different places, but the historical record suggests that most articles of undergarments followed this general path. In Mesopotamia, circa 3000 BCE, loincloths were morphed into primitive briefs, but they were not yet worn as underclothes. Sumerian terracotta figures depict women wearing what we now call underpants, in the style of briefs, um, with nothing on top. Their breasts were exposed. The same was true for women in ancient Egypt. Uh, Their breasts were usually visible, though their outer garments were much more linear and elaborate than Mesopotamian loincloths. Even though they may have invented briefs, can we really call them underwear if nothing was worn over them? Probably not. Um, And interestingly, in both of these societies, men and women wore the same garments. So it's hard for us to imagine, um, but clothing was apparently ungendered for most of human history. When I say most, I mean if you consider humans beginning 200,000 years ago or whatever. Um, So uh, we can see this when uh, women became Egyptian pharaohs, like Hatshepsut. Um, They wore beards because, well, pharaohs had beards, whether they were men or women. Um, This doesn't mean that people themselves weren't gendered. They certainly were. But their garments just tended not to function as a tool of gender. The development of underwear was far from linear. Some cultures developed elaborate undergarments, very similar to the ones we now know. Then these garments were lost to history for several centuries at a time, only to be reinvented again somewhere else. For example, we have a few surviving images of women from the island of Crete, home to the Bronze Age Minoan civilization. Cretan women were bare-breasted, just like women in Mesopotamia and Egypt, but they wore what appear to have been a corset or crinoline around their middles and bottoms. Crinolines are hoop skirts, but keep in mind this was 3,800 years before the invention of the hoop skirt. None of these garments survive, and we see nothing like them again for thousands of years. But it's still interesting to point out that items we see as fundamentally modern may have existed in cultures that are now lost to us. Ancient Greeks were descended from Bronze Age Minoans, so perhaps it's unsurprising that they are credited with having invented primitive corsets and braziers. In classical Greece, they didn't wear undergarments per se, but women used bands of cloth to achieve certain functions uh, that underwear would later serve. Greek men and women commonly bound their waists with a girdle made of linen tied tight around their middle, and this was called a zona. It cinched their tunics and also served as a primitive sort of pocket underneath their draped clothing. They could wear a toga, and they would have this this, um, girdle wrapped around their middle, and they would kind of stuff stuff in there, kind of how a woman might stuff something in her bra. How I always Um, get undressed at night and all this stuff falls out of my bra. Food, mostly, but... Um, so, uh, women also wore striophions, which were twisted swaths of linen that were tied underneath the breasts for support. They were typically worn over a tunic, so it's not quite underwear, but it's supportive like a brassiere might be. Many women, especially women athletes, also wore breast bands, and these are also, these are called, uh, mastodismos. Um, They were uh, bands of linen that were tied tight around the woman's breast to support and de-emphasize their chests. Scholars liken these to primitive sports bras. The goal of wearing one was to prevent breasts from moving around during strenuous activity. Much needed. Yes, absolutely. I get it. I totally get it. 
Spartan goddesses were depicted as wearing briefs, like those depicted on Mesopotamians, as well as a more elaborate breastband called a stethodesmos. So they have all these different kind of desmos. Desmos just means band. Mm. And this stethodesmos um, had straps that went over the shoulder. These resemble modern brassiers, but it would be a mistake to associate them with the bras that we know and hate today. These were pragmatic solutions for Greek women warriors and athletes who were hampered by uncomfortable and inconvenient breast tissue during their exercises. So they had nothing to do with preserving modesty or the sexualization of breasts. Most Greek women were still going topless. Topless. Yeah, Yeah, that makes sense. So it's just to get them out of the way and to avoid the pain when they're when you're jumping yes. around. Purely functional. Yeah. Okay. Nonetheless, these, my friends, are very early examples of foundation garments. Foundation garments were also underwear, but they serve two functions which are closely related to each other. One, to give shape to outer layers of clothing, and two, to permanently modify people's bodies. Even though these foundation garments may have been functional for the ancient Greeks, later cultures would use the same principles of support and structure to create foundation garments that served complex social, cultural, and symbolic functions in patriarchal societies, which we'll get to later. This happens a lot in history. Some sort of technology that was meant to solve a practical problem morphs into something that has deep cultural meaning. This is definitely the case with the forebear to all men's undergarments, quote, barbarian trousers. Ooh, Obviously, I'm not calling them that. Fancy. Yeah, very fancy and manly. <laughs> um, so initially, trousers served a practical purpose for Eurasian tribal groups. They fitted closer to the body than the loose draperies worn by Mediterranean peoples. They kept Germanic and Asiatic peoples warm in their cooler climates. Celtic people called them braes. They were also specifically designed for horseback riding, um, an activity that was central to nomadic culture and survival. Both men and women wore trousers. Roman historian Tacitus wrote about the Germanic peoples that he encountered, and he said that their bottom clothes were, quote, tight and exhibits each limb, end quote, like as if this is revolutionary. (laughs) Um, These fashions were worn by both men and women. During the decline of the Roman Empire, trousers quickly became political. Roman soldiers took to wearing trousers as a strategy to appear more barbaric. And as the Roman Empire fell, trouser wearing was briefly criminalized in certain parts of the empire as a treasonous act. Averill's episode on breeches will get uh, even further into some of these issues surrounding the cultural meaning of pants. But I want to mention it now because it'll come up again. Pants, pants, pants. Pants. The Roman capital was relocated to Constantinople in the 6th century CE. For the next millennium, the Byzantine Empire would serve as the world's most powerful empire. By this time, nomadic tribes and Mediterranean peoples had coexisted in the same regions for centuries. Germanic and Asiatic tribes became increasingly sedentary, adopting the loose-fitting garments of the Romans. Mediterranean peoples had also depoliticized and decriminalized the wearing of trousers. Trousers were the precursor to two-legged garments, breeches, chaps, boxer shorts, slacks, and pants. During the medieval period, trousers were also not particularly masculine. In fact, they were most popular among busy-legged garteen women who often wore knee-length trousers. The following robes and togas of the Romans slowly morphed into more structured tunics, and two-legged garments gave way to knit stockings. This combination of garments became the basic uniform for most societies in the Western world for the next thousand years. Braids or trousers were still worn by men, especially laborers and horsemen. The tunic and stockings or trousers served as a kind of blank slate. By tracing the changes in these garments, we can see the painfully slow emergence of undergarments. Men and women's attire was quite similar in the early stages of the medieval period and neither generally wore underpants. But they did wear uh, an undershirt of sorts, and it was called a chemise. A chemise is basically a long tunic or shirt made out of some kind of lightly woven material. It was T-shaped, and it was worn by both men and women, like a like a nightgown, maybe. Mm-hmm. Men wore them under cloaks or mantles. Women wore them under a woolen tunic or tunic dress. 
Women's chemises were most often called ships, so that's that's probably what we'll um, tend to call them. And uh, women wore them into the 20th century. More on that later. Um, their primary function was hygienic. They wicked sweat and other bodily fluids away from the skin and protected their outer layers, uh, which were less washable, from their excretions and secretions. They were cheaper and easier to wash, so people could um, change and launder them more often and more easily than the heavy outer garments, which would be like wool and mm-hmm. other heavy things. Um, chemises also protected skin from the rough, scratchy fabrics that they wore on the outside. But chemises are only half underwear. Both men and women wore chemises against the skin, yes, but they were often designed to be visible beneath outer garments. So um, chemises and shifts were often called body linens because they sat directly against the body, but they could also serve as outerwear. They were not generally hidden from sight. So store this thought away in your back pocket for later because this will become important in the 18th century. I think you've probably seen like at Ren Fairs or something, you know, people would have like a white sort of shift and then they'd have a course that they'd wear on the outside. You can sort of still see the arms and the And didn't they even the call that, they called that slashing on the sides yeah, of so their so that you could see sleeves. through yeah. the sleeves, yeah, yeah, and see the shift. And sometimes people did wear colorful shifts too. Mm. Like, well, rich people did. By the time of the High Middle Ages, so 1000 CE to about 1250 CE, garments were becoming increasingly gendered. European women never wore two-legged garments. Ever. 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 Women in the Near East and Asia continued to wear trousers during this time. It became a defining feature of Moorish women, African Muslims who had conquered southern Spain. European women would not wear two-legged garments again until the 19th century with the invention of bloomers. Despite the strict ban on pants, medieval women's clothing evolved extensively. Women began donning garments which closely fitted their form. Initially, their tunics lengthened and tightened into form-fitting dresses which were laced in the back. Over time, women laced these tunic dresses more and more tightly. By the 12th century, the modern corset or girdle emerged out of these tight tunic dresses. There is an illustrated manuscript from this period which shows the devil, dressed as a woman of course, wearing a fitted girdle, bodice, and a tulip skirt. Men's fashion also became more form-fitting. Men's tunics became tighter and shorter, and elites consistently chose stockings over trousers. If Greek and Roman fashion was all about the quality of the material, medieval fashion was all about the silhouette. For the first time in recorded history, people were striving to achieve an ideal body shape. It is not surprising, then, that medieval societies turned to foundation garments, underwear, to achieve their fashion goals. But it took time. For example, the corset or girdle um, was for hundreds of years an outer garment. It wasn't until the 15th century that the girdle became underwear. As I mentioned earlier, clothing became increasingly elaborate over time with more and more layers. Um, And this was a slow and uneven process. And it's why we've been uh, talking mainly about outerwear for the first half of this episode. Um, The 15th century was precisely the time when all the outerwear we've been tracing so far, so briefs, trousers, tunics, girdles, um, became what we now call underwear. Somewhere in this period, European people took their body shaping underground, or more accurately, under clothes. The earliest known bra dates to the 15th century, and it was found in Langeberg Castle in Austria in 2008. Um, So we didn't know about this for all of history until like 10 years ago. And then we were like, oh, people did have bras. Um, So it's shoulder boulder. Yeah, exactly. Um. (laughs) That's probably what they called it. Um, it is. It's mostly um, intact today, which is just crazy because it's like this little like linen thing. Oh, wow. Um, and what did it's they just, just find it in a trunk or something? No, they uh, they found it in um, there had been. It's it was in a castle, and they found kind of like a hidden compartment that had been built over oh, at some God. point, you know, two hundred years ago. Yeah. And and they filled up this built over part with garbage so that it had <laughs> so some sort of somebody's old bra. Yeah. So they're like, let's throw this this old bra on here um and it just kind of like was the perfect temperature or whatever to to keep it from degrading um so this find solved some mysteries for medievalists who had been unable to define an article of clothing that was referred to in manuscripts as breast bags 
Um, French royal surgeon Henri de Monville wrote around um, 1300, quote, some women insert two bags in their dresses adjusted to the breasts, fitting tight, and they put them, meaning their breasts, into them, meaning the bags, every morning and fasten them when possible with a matching band. Until this breast bag was found recently, no one had any idea what he was talking about. Um, and I want to point out that these items were probably just for elites. So ordinary women likely didn't wear any kind of breast bags. I love this so hard. Breast bags. <laughs> I know. Ah, oh, Victoria's Secret Pure Bears of yeah. breast bags. <laughs> It's interesting to think about what this might mean that 12th century Europeans wore their body shapers on the outside, but by the 15th century, this was no longer acceptable. People still wanted to give their bodies and their outer garments pleasing shapes, but they didn't want their efforts to be visible to the outside world. So even though underwear served many purposes and still does, it was the function of shape giving that ultimately led to the advent of underwear as we know it today. So garments that you wear under your clothes that are not supposed to be seen. Now, there have been endless books written about corsets, bun rolls, crinoline, farthingales, the list goes on. And that stuff is fun and culturally meaningful. But being the trailblazers we are, we're going to take this episode in another direction. Yes, and the direction we're going to take it in is toward men and penises and their special penis clothes. Penis so here bags. penis bags, yes. So here we have breast bags and then now these are the penis bags. So um here is some evidence that body image was just as important to men as it was to women. The 15th century was a critical time for men's intimate apparel. This marks the rise of the codpiece. Cod pieces, like many garments before it, began as a practical invention. We mentioned earlier that medieval men's clothes began to be more form-fitting than they had been in ancient times. Nowhere is this more visible than in stockings or hose. So um, I think you've probably seen portraits of Henry VIII, and they, there's like this huge focus on his calves and like how muscular mm -hmm. his calves are because the hose are like real tight and... Mm -hmm. um, the same for uh, Louis the Fourteenth. You can so, see that. So a lot. the calves were the were the biceps. Yeah. Were the guns of the exactly of the, what eighteenth century. No, exactly. That's like the sixteenth century. Huh? It's the yeah. It's the fifteenth through seventeenth century that that would hold true. Okay. Um, is the calves were where it was at? Where was that, ladies? So right. So the hose um were wear them were sort of similar to what they are today, tight fitting garments that wrap around the leg, but um they were the ones that were worn by medieval men, they're made of slack knit material, not the elastic hose that we wear today. So rayon and nylon hadn't been invented, so we're talking like wool. Mm. Um, or silk sometimes. So the only way to wear them was as separate pieces, one for each leg, because you had these sort of, you wanted them to be tight, but you couldn't have a garment that was tight and then came up, you know, over your belly and like that wouldn't, it wouldn't work when you don't have stretchy material. So um, since medieval men and women um, didn't wear underpants, men's genitals just kind of hung free under their tunics, um, sitting there in between their their stockings, legs. Um, and at the end of the 15th century, tunics became so short and tight that men devised a leather flap to protect their genitals and hide them from view because they were starting to get so so tight and that they said, oh man, I'm, you know, peeking out here. So um, these were dubbed cod pieces because cod means, uh, it means purse, mm. um, was slang for scrotum. So oh. they'd call it like, yeah, your, you know, your penis purse or whatever. Um, so this uh, leather penis pouch quickly developed into ornamental cod pieces. Padded cod pieces, um, the forebears of today's athletic cups, were devised to be worn under armor. Some men wore cod pieces with compartments that functioned as pockets because they're like, oh, I can just put yeah. my change in here. Um, and so these innovations sparked a cod piece arms race like you wouldn't believe, especially in the English court. 
The men in uh, Henry VIII's entourage began sporting larger and more elaborate codpieces. They began to symbolize masculinity and virility. So some of these just look like large bulges. I think that's probably the most common kind. But eventually, men in the Henrician court began to wear codpieces that were shaped like flaccid penises. So it looked like they had this like trunk, this like hard little <laughs> trunk. And then eventually, like erect penises. Oh my God. So they're you know, so for a brief time, um, men were walking. <laughs> around the English court with padded, bedazzled, prosthetic erections. Yes. Think about what that means. <laughs> so, um, unsurprisingly, this fashion died shortly after Henry did. Um, by the time Elizabeth I ascended to the throne in 1558, so that was about 11 years after Henry died, um, elaborate codpieces were past their prime. And as her persona of the Virgin Queen developed over the following decades, it became unseemly for men at court to emphasize their virility in such an obvious and material way. Oh um, as you can imagine, it would have been men walking around with these, you know, fake erections. Blinged out. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, okay. with like, you know, <laughs> pearls and all kinds of things. I love this so much. I, it's so crazy. Okay, so we uh, we already mentioned several functions of underwear in the episode so far. Class distinction, cleanliness, shaping, warmth, and emphasizing your junk. <laughs> the rise and fall of the codpiece, pun intended, wow. <laughs> suggests that around this time, intimate apparel was beginning to fulfill another function entirely. The codpiece and other instances of tightening and form altering serve as early examples of the erotic function of underwear. The best example of this now might be the corsets and frilly lingerie you find at intimate apparel stores or sex shops. It seems obvious uh, to us now that underwear has an erotic function, especially women's underwear. I don't know. I like the uh, banana hammocks that have a, a um, elephant ears on them, <laughs> personally. <laughs> or the... the edible banana hammock oh god um but uh right right so obviously underwear has been sexualized as we just um laid right. bare there yes um and fetishized for centuries but this was obviously not always the case as we've learned um so for most of human history apparel was so simple just draped fabric that undressing for sexy time was easy and unceremonial as clothing became more complex however undergarments when they were used were simple and usually bottomless so sexual intercourse was easy to do when fully clothed most of them were having sex in the dark on pallets shared with the entire family there was no reason to develop different kinds of attire for intimate encounters typical folks could not afford such a luxury anyway and there was nothing particularly erotic about any kind of intimate apparel. Shifts or chemises were functional garments, and they were flowy and made out of cheap material. Remember, foundation garments, such as girdles, had been, up until the 15th century, worn on the outside. It is probably not a coincidence that foundation garments began to be worn on the insides of clothing around the same time that cod pieces became erotic rather than functional attire. Unsurprisingly, given their proximity to genitalia, people were beginning to understand undergarments as inherently erotic. I have a question. So yeah. when you're talking about the, the hose then, the tights, yeah. to keep them up, is that... Did they, is that they 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 tied strings around the tops of yeah. their thighs to keep them up. Did they yeah. call those girdles? I no, no, I don't think so. Garters. garters, garters. That's what I mean. Garters. Yeah, I don't know if they even called them garters that early. I mean, I think they. Okay. They probably just would have called them fastenings or something. Oh, okay. Um, because they fastened them there. But like, I think garters were started to be called garters once they were like fancy looking, and once well, women were wearing them with garter belts. Call garters the 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 garter belts that men wore around their to hold up their socks. socks. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they, maybe they did call them garters. I'll, I'll have to look into that. I'm I don't. Sorry, I shouldn't have even brought it. No, up it's totally fine. I, I, I didn't come across anyone calling them gar calling it garters. They would just say that they would like tie a string or like a, um, twisted, uh, piece of fabric around. Yeah. So I imagine the circulation would be awful. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. If you're used to it, I, I guess. guess. Yeah. Um. So also, at the same time, the printing press began distributing what? Bibles. Yes, tons of Bibles. Bibles. But also, by the 16th century, they were uh, bringing erotica to the masses. 
Shakespeare is Venus and Adonis, um, an erotic narrative poem, hit the presses in 1593 and went through more than 16 editions in the next 50 years, which is, that's a, that's a ton. Um, it's true uh, the 15th and 16th centuries were a bit slow on the erotica department, um, but we'll forgive them since it was plagued by religious revival, puritanical fundamentalism, and religious wars. But the 17th century more than made up for this. Erotic verse became particularly popular during the 16th hundreds, and these poems paid particular attention to women's undergarments and the act of undressing. And I have some examples for you. Yes. You're lucky. Yes. Here are, um, I have four examples because they're quite short, of um, examples of 17th century erotic verse. And um, just note the emphasis on, on the garments themselves. So the first one is by Sir William Jones. So, quote, when she sleeps at noon, her bed is besprinkled with musk. She puts on her robe of undress, but leaves the apron to her maids, end quote. So that's not so crazy. The, but the robe of undress being like a robe. Of, would have been like a shift or right. like a night. Just undress meaning meant this is what I'm wearing around the house okay. and I'm not going to a function like that. Gotcha. Um, so, uh, and then there's, this, there's one by um, John Dunn called To His Mistress Going to Bed. Um, quote, unpin that spangled breastplate which you wear, that the eyes of busy fools may be stopped there. Unlace yourself for that harmonious chime tells me from you that now it is bedtime. End quote. Mm-hmm. And then we have one called um, To His Mistress Desirous to Go to Bed, and that's from John Cotgrave's Wits Interpreter. So this is 1655. Quote, Fairest, let me thy night clothes air. Come, I'll unlace thy stomacher. Make me thy maiden chamberman, or let me be thy warming pan. End quote. Got some good rhyme in there. <laughs> and then lastly, um, this is called, this is a quote from um, the Hasty Bridegroom from Roxburgh Ballads. And these um, were written between 1674 and 1681. Quote, that the flowers of virgins encloses, and I will not be too rough unto thee, for my nature unto boldness is prone. Do no less than undress and unlace all apace, for this night I'll make use with my own, end quote. So this was a slow and uneven process, but by the middle of the early modern period, the garments we've talked about so far were popularized, eroticized, and brought underneath the clothes. So undergarments were no longer rare, functional, or practical. They were hidden, secret, naughty, and unmentionable. Undergarments began to be referred to as unmentionables in the 1700s. This was also the time when erotica really took off in the form of images. Prior to the 1700s, women were portrayed as either entirely nude, like in a classical Greek sense, or entirely clothed. Think every straight-laced early modern portrait that you ever seen. But in the 1700s, artists began portraying women in their underclothes. How scandalous. (laughs) Most 18th century erotica shows men and women as partially dressed or in process of stripping. And Thomas Rowlandson's extensive compendium of erotica, for example, people are almost never nude. And we don't mean the never nudes from (laughs) Arrested Development. The teen shorts. (laughs) They are wearing intimate apparel, shifts, bloomers, girdles, stockings, garters, and dressing gowns. To the 18th century, this was even more shocking than nudity because nudity itself was not obscene or titillating. These people were much more comfortable with nudity than we are today. Um, And so Eric Seaman, one of the professors at UB, um, told me a story from the archives that had struck him. And and it was completely unrelated to what he was researching. It was just on the side, but he thought it was funny. So he came across um, an 18th century trial where a deponent was discussing his inability to get an erection. And he told his neighbor about it one day when they ran into each other out like they were going to far- they're farming or something and they kind of saw each other and he said oh hey um you know i have this problem and the neighbor said oh yeah let me see maybe i can help and the deponent somehow exhibited his penis and demonstrated his impotence to the, his neighbor mm-hmm. um, without any awkwardness or feelings of impropriety at all. Um, and the exchange was just mentioned as a casual aside. Mm-hmm. Um, so in this world, a partially clothed body 
um, was infinitely more erotic than a nude body and more suggestive. Like the nudity part of it is just sort of like, okay, it's a naked person. Mm -hmm. So the eroticization of undergarments coincided with their increased complexity. Women continued to wear shifts for the practical and hygienic reasons we mentioned earlier. But from the 16th to 18th centuries, women began wearing under petticoats, hoops or panniers, and stockings um, on their bottom halves. So the girdle of yore had improved into incredibly restrictive stays. Um, Stays are boned girdles that are um, very stiff and laced up the back. And they also, like, start, like, right under your boobs and then go all the way down to, like, your pubic bone. They're Mm. really, like, long. Of course, fashions varied considerably over time and space, but for most early modern women, stays were standard. In England, stays were more common than in France, where they were worn only by elites and on special occasions. Stays briefly fell out of fashion after the French Revolution. Um, It became stylish for women to go without structured support garments and for them to wear these sort of diaphanous French peasant dresses and shepherdess hats because they wanted to look like... You know, the, this is the Marie Antoinette thing where mm-hmm. you, like, love the peasant farmers or whatever, right. but just in, like, a symbolic kind of way. Kind of fetishized way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but this trend only lasted for a decade or so. So most people, most of the time, were wearing stays. Mm-hmm. 18th century men wore a linen chemise, or basically a shift for men, and sometimes drawers. Most men tucked their chemise between their legs to act as makeshift underpants. But by the 1700s, it was becoming more common for men to wear drawers under their breeches. Drawers were uh, usually made of linen and looked a lot like breeches, but tighter and thinner. These two-legged garments derived from trousers and later evolved into knickerbockers and then into underpants as we know them today. Men also wore stockings, which were usually cuffed over the ends of their breeches. Over this uniform of undergarments, they would wear all of their overclothes. Some scholars have argued that body linens, shifts, and chemises, that is, became linked to social respectability in this period. For centuries, Europeans had been wearing body linens for practical purposes, but around 1700, body linens took on a new significance. And note this similar pattern, a garment is used for practical purposes, and then it slowly becomes a cultural symbol. Scholar Kathleen Brown describes this aspect of 18th century life in her book, Foul Bodies. She is writing about the 18th century Atlantic world, so the European, African, and American peoples whose livelihoods and cultural worlds revolved around the Atlantic Ocean. This was a highly racialized context. Middle class and elite white people in European and American cities were growing wealthy, in part due to the unfree labor of enslaved Africans, and this wealth afforded them luxuries that ordinary folks could not have dreamed of 100 years earlier. So these people were able to afford many shifts and many pairs of stockings and many and more elaborate overclothes. Um, They used these resources to build up their social status and their body linens were incredibly important to this process. They were able to achieve better hygiene standards by washing their shifts daily. They could have like seven shifts and Mm -hmm. then just wash one because it would take a a few days to wash and dry one, um, but they could just always have a clean one every day. It became a cultural contest of sorts. People were trying to make their shifts, which um, would show at their necks and their wrists, once again, as white and refined as possible. This denoted wealth, cleanliness, and conscientiousness. Over the century, hygiene became a primary way for whites to differentiate themselves from black bodies. People of color, many of them enslaved or impoverished, couldn't afford these body linens or to keep them impeccably clean. Whites were able to point to their hygiene and refinement as evidence of their superiority. People of color who socialized in white circles picked up on this association and entered the contest themselves, donning um, stark white shifts that were impeccably clean. And Kathy Brown, um, who we mentioned earlier, uh, she argues that people like Ulada Equiano, who's a free black man who influenced British abolition, the people like him um, used body linen as a proxy for white skin. So they had these very white body linens. Um, and, you know, as he hobnobbed with wealthy and educated abolitionists in Britain, his laundered, bleached, and starched body linens sent them the message that he was just like them. Mm. 18th century hygiene was also tied to sexual morality. Dirty linens meant that they were sexually promiscuous. When someone was quote-unquote clean, they were laundered, washed, but it could also mean that they were free from disease. 
And we still see that word used in the same context today. But in the 1700s, if someone's linens were not clean and white, they were assumed to be sexually unclean as well. This conflation of sexuality and hygiene became so intense that the woman who cleaned linens for a living, laundresses, often were likened to prostitutes. They were considered to be tainted by the filth that surrounded them. As hygiene and occupation became increasingly gendered, so too did underwear. Note that it was still unthinkable for women to wear two-legged garments, a convention that appears to have begun in the earlier medieval period in Europe. So even though men were starting to wear underpants, women were not. And this is so startling because if anyone could have benefited from underpants, it was women. Vaginas produce all kinds of fluid, menstrual blood, routine just charge, and lochia after childbirth. It had to have been incredibly inconvenient for women to manage their vaginal hygiene with no underpants to hold menstrual rags in place. In the 18th century world, where your worth was tied to the whiteness of your linen, women were at a distinct disadvantage. There's evidence that some women in the medieval and early modern world used a contraption of twisted cloth that hugged their hips and held menstrual rags in place. And this would have resembled a primitive jockstrap. Some scholars argue that in most places, for most of human history, women bled free. This would have been more convenient for women who routinely wore long skirts. They would just bleed down their legs all day, and then the mess would be hidden by their skirts and by several layers of petticoats. And then they would likely wipe themselves down at night. This was probably common practice for societies which had not yet adopted underclothes as part of their daily attire. It was also the norm for societies that practiced seclusion of menstruating women either at home or in specially made spaces because some areas that was just part of the culture was, you know, when you're menstruating, you're in the menstrual hut or whatever. Right, right. Once women started wearing shifts in the medieval period, they, like men, tucked the linen in between their legs to absorb their blood. This technique was common until the end of the 19th century. After the clean linens craze of the 18th century, the Industrial Revolution kicked off in earnest, and again, most ordinary people were struggling financially and therefore hygienically. Cities ran on coal-fired power, and workers crowded into small apartments with subpar facilities. To make matters worse, there were few statutes regulating the wages and treatment of workers. Physicians and reformers argued that disease, poor hygiene, and a lack of infrastructure was destroying people's quality of life. Much of this reform was aimed at women. In 1899, a female physician in Germany named Hope Bridges Adam Lehman addressed the practice of using one's chemise as a menstrual rag. Quote, it is completely disgusting to bleed into your chemise and wearing that same chemise for four to eight days can cause infections. Now it's like, no. (laughs) (laughs) Can you imagine? No, absolutely not. So we know that some women used crude menstrual rags for centuries. And in 1888, Southos introduced disposable sanitary pads. But still, most women were choosing to bleed into their chemise instead. Why? Because they weren't wearing underwear. It was difficult for women to keep menstrual rags in place. To be sure, some women had found solutions that worked for them, but most women fell back on using their body linens. For a brief time in the 19th century, women had the chance to wear two-legged garments and address this logistical problem. Um, So Averill will cover this in her episode on pants, and I think Elizabeth uh, mentions it as well. So I won't go into too much detail. Um, But in the 1850s, American women began wearing bloomers or trousers, um, such as women had worn in the ancient world and Muslim women continued to wear at the time. Women turned to bloomers to give them more options when menstruating. This is just one of the many reasons. Um, They also didn't drag on the filthy streets like petticoats did, and it gave women better mobility. So they were especially popular among women's rights activists. This made the public outcry all the more vicious. In 1851, an editorial in the New York Times read, quote, We regret to see how obstinately our American women are bent on appropriating more than their fair share of constitutional privileges. There is an obvious tendency to encroach upon masculine manners, which cannot be too severely rebuked or too speedily repressed. Good lord. Oh my god. The ladies are wearing pants. guy needs to get laid. No, I'm just kidding. Hell is freezing over. I know, it's just crazy. So, um, most of the American public agreed. 
bloomer wearing women were accused of being sexually deviant or grotesquely masculine. Um, once again, your underclothes acting as evidence of your sexual behavior. Mm-hmm. And we see this today with people who wear thongs that you can see outside of your clothes. People right. are like, oh, you're a slut or whatever. Right. It's, you know, it's the or same like thing. Sending girls home from school because their bra strap is showing. Or yeah, like yeah. That. Don't yeah. even get me started. But yes. Um, so this ridicule was too much for most women to bear in a time when sexual purity and femininity were prized assets. American women gave up their bloomers for the most part. But the fight for comfortable undergarments continued. The National Dress Reform Association was established in 1856, and its mission was to fight for comfortable undergarments for women. For them, this meant eliminating the corset and restricting the weight of a woman's undergarments to seven pounds. Oh my god, only seven pounds. I know. Jesus. Over the course of the 19th century, feminist reformers succeeded somewhat in reducing the restrictiveness of women's undergarments. Fewer women were wearing corsets, and those that were were wearing corsets um, that were shorter, softer version of the stays their mothers and their grandmothers wore. With these changes came a slew of corset substitutes with silly names like the symmetrical rotundity, <laughs> uh, the corselet gorge, and the flint waist. Okay, those are dumb. Yeah. Um, sometime in the 1880s, the first modern brassiere was invented. It allowed for breast support and shaping without the crushing pressure of any kind of girdle. In the UK, men and women sometimes wore drawers. So even though in the U.S. bloomers quickly went out of fashion, um, in the U.K., men and women sometimes wore drawers, like not a- instead of petticoats, but like under their petticoats. Um, so for women, they were called knickerbockers or knickers. Um, for men's drawers, um, they began to be referred to as pants. And these terms are still used today. So people use the term knickers for women's panties or whatever and uh, pants as men's underwear which causes a lot of confusion because we just call trousers or whatever pants um it's like chips and fries yeah just it's just (laughs) messed up but um so but two-legged garments remain controversial and many women in the western world continued to go without underpants but i just wanted to mention that you know there were some women who were wearing these two um two-legged garments not usually in any way that was visible, mm-hmm. just you know, like for convenience, like hey, I need an extra these layer pants, yeah. right? Nineteenth mm-hmm. century men continued to use the chemise trick sometimes, where they would kind of tuck it in between their legs, or they would wear drawers, like we mentioned before. Their undergarments remained incredibly simple and functional compared to women's. Of course, grumble. <laughs> um, so there were some crossover, though, between men's and women's underwear in the 19th century, but mostly in America, um, upstate New York specifically, actually, um, feminists in upstate New York began wearing the union suit. So the union suit, um, it's also known as long john, so basically mm. long underwear, um, began as women's underwear, a feminist alternative to petticoats and corsets. And I would imagine much warmer. Yeah, yeah. right. That's what, you know, in the cold yeah. New York, you it's know, evenings. very cold here. Right. Um, But by the 1860s, men had co-opted the garment. Mm. The union suit became the undergarment of choice for working class men. In 1868, uh, one was patented with an access hatch. And there's all kinds of things that they call it um, in the front. So men could just, you know, I don't know, pull their penis out and urinate without Mm. taking them off. Um, So this is an example of how gendered the garment industry was. As soon as men took a liking to a garment, they underwent rapid research and development so that they would be as convenient and functional as possible. And this was not really the case for women. Mm. After 1900, the underwear industry exploded. In 1909, the undergarment section of the International Ladies' Garment Workers Union, which we discuss in our other episode about shirtwaists, uh, was established. So they they established the undergarment section of that union. Uh, And this signaled that underwear was being mass-produced, cleverly marketed, and consumed on a larger scale. Women began to wear drawers regularly, but they were made of linen and fell at the knee. The invention of rayon underpants in 1910 was a game changer. Known as artificial silk, rayon was softer, more durable, and more elastic than linen. This new fabric allowed for the evolution of the brief. For women, rayon drawers allowed for a snugger, shorter fit. These were still giant by today's standards. I mean, they still, they went up to like right (laughs) under your boobs and then they were like almost shorts. Oh, they sound like period panties. Yeah, just super, yeah, super (laughs) giant granny panties. 
<laughs> but compared to these long bloomers that sure. were pants, right, right, right. they were smaller. Okay. So women continued to wear brassiers and the 20th century version of the shift, uh, a slip, pantyhose made of the newly developed nylon replaced stockings and garters in the 1950s. For men, rayon and later nylon led to the development of the Y-front brief, often referred to as tidy whities Briefs were inspired by jock straps worn by sportsmen and by Speedo-like bathing suits that men began wearing in the French Riviera in the 1920s. Boxer shorts were originally developed for professional boxers. Hence the name. Huh? Nah, get it. Uh, they were redesigned as underwear in the 1920s when Jacob Gollum replaced the leather waistband with an elastic rayon band and added a button fly. Men who found briefs too confining chose boxer shorts. Brief lovers desired more support. In World War II, both types of underpants were issued to American servicemen. This is just sort of a, a comment on one was not one didn't replace the other one wasn't right. more popular than the other they were just sort of like here it's personal choice separate, right yeah. exactly yeah. and um i think once people started realizing that that briefs could cause um lower sperm counts mm-hmm. because it was like holding everything up too high the heat but that you doesn't know, then, come to like much later right no 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 i'm just saying it's one of the many things like you know so those people who are worried about that would say oh i'm going to switch to boxers mm-hmm. and you know so mm-hmm. it was it's still an ongoing thing. right, or or now they have the boxer briefs. Yeah, since the nineties, <laughs> boxer briefs. Um, yeah, that's a very thank you, Marky Mark. Right, that's a very recent <laughs> um, phenomenon. Um, so, even though intimates have become near universal, mass-produced garments, they still have symbolic associations that might be worth mentioning. So historical undergarments, such as corsets or garter belts, serve erotic functions today that they might not have when they were everyday wear. At many weddings today, the groom ceremoniously removes the bride's decorative garter with his teeth, a symbol of impending nuptial relations, um, and the bra, which was touted as a symbol of women's emancipation from the corset, has come to be regarded as a symbol of patriarchal confinement. So women today are wondering if bras are really necessary. Some understand going braless as a challenge to the idea that women's breasts are obscene. At the same time, shapers are more popular than they've ever been in in recent decades. Spanx, waist cinchers, compression garments. Mm -hmm. Um, So are these items designed for women looking for support, or are they designed for men who want women's bodies to look a certain way? I mean, it's probably... It's probably a little bit of both. Um, Right. And so these are all complicated questions, and we won't answer them here today. But we would love to hear your thoughts on uh, today's underwear politics. Right. I don't know. I I guess my most – my favorite part about this is this idea of, like, a Greek sports bra, right? Because, Mm -hmm. like, I don't know, not to be too, like, personal or anything, but I feel like sports bras are, are coming back into fashion, like, that you can – and, like, the, the the style of, like, bralettes now. Like, women are even, like, foregoing underwires. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like it's – like, for a while there, you couldn't even buy a bra without an underwire. And now mm-hmm. it's, like, very much – either that or maybe I'm just moving into the older ladies section. <laughs> yeah, like, you're just becoming an old lady. <laughs> and I'm just, like, like underwire. No, no I think I bralettes know. are a thing because people are, like, sort of fighting back to that restrictive underwire. Like, your boobs have to be this yeah, shape. Yeah, have to be and a certain roundness. <laughs> Hiked up to this right. level and, right. um, you know, you know, most people, as soon as they get home, just want to take their bra off, right. you know, their main Yeah, thing. if you call me after the bra is coming off, I ain't going out of the house. Sorry. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> um, that taken, means the day is over. <laughs> I've taken Remy to the bus stop before without wearing a bra. Oh, yeah, no. And nobody that's... noticed. But, yeah, it's just interesting because when the bra was invented, it was like, oh, this is for feminists because sure. – um, you know, if or you just wear, a freedom of movement. Thing. Right. If you wear yeah. this bra, you'll still have your boobs covered up, but you don't have to wear a corset. Yeah. Um, and it totally changed um, women's silhouettes. I mean, literally, if you just took women today and we all got a corset naked and you took pictures and you compared it to naked women 50 years ago, our bodies would be actually different shapes. Right. And it's part of it would be we're all chubbier, I guess, would be <laughs> part of it. But also another part of it is that we didn't wear this restrictive shaping underwear for mm-hmm you know, the majority of our 
um, no, absolutely. Pubescent wearing, ears. wearing a corset every day or, or some kind of tight lacing or whatever does change your body shape. Right. Absolutely. Well, and it's interesting, too, because I, I have a friend who owns a retro clothing store. So, like, they kind of specialize in, like, 50s clothing. And she's she's constantly trying or having to kind of educate her her customers about wearing proper foundations, right? So women will buy these like 1950s kind of vintage cut dresses and be really unhappy that they don't look right in them. And so my friend is constantly have to say, well, is constantly having to say, well, you have to wear at least a girdle. You have to wear a corset, some kind of like structured foundation under these dress or yeah, it's not going to look like it's from 1950s because you have a 2018 body and right. you're trying to make it look like 1950s body, but 1950s body were shaped by these, you know, really right. stiff foundations. So if you right. want the dress to look a certain way, you have to wear the same kind of underwear they used to. Right. And the dresses were shaped that way. Like my, my grandmother, so my grandmother was born in 29 and she um, had some old skirts that she used to wear when she was like in her young 30s, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe young, or older 20s. So like really, really, really old skirts that she had found kind of stashed away somewhere. And she gave them to me. And at the time I was like a size four. It was very small. And they were like a size eight. And she gave them to me and was like, and here, too- they didn't fit yeah. me. Mm-hmm. They were too small. Yeah. But it was mostly just because of the, the waist. Like the, the waist, waist was yes. like teeny tiny. And I was like, I cannot wear these. No, my mom did the exact you know? thing. And, and I mean, my mom, these dresses were like from, I don't know, I guess the fifties or something. And so they were, they were dresses and it was the same thing. I was like in high school. I mean, I was like a size zero, you know, mm-hmm. working out three hours a day doing basketball and stuff like that. Couldn't get this thing like zipped right. up the side. Right. But mostly know. just because of the, sh- I'll bet, but I'll bet you though, like, I don't know if my grandma's underwear still existed. I hope it doesn't. <laughs> but if it did, it would probably be giant on me because she, she was wearing these shaping, these shaping yeah. garments that were like pushing everything down and up and um you know it's just it's that's really fascinating to me is that you know our actual bodies are shaped differently Mm -hmm. because of the foundations that we wear yeah I sometimes kind of wish that I wore stays all throughout like (laughs) all throughout (laughs) I would have a much more pleasing silhouette if I did so you know that's a whole like discussion that's going on like uh, the Kardashians have been showing themselves wearing these quote unquote body shapers which Mm -hmm. are there's no boning to them whatsoever it's just these like um, kind of latex whatever they make they're supposed to make you sweat you know oh yeah yeah yeah. I've seen these on Facebook you know Um, you know, and so there's, there's also discussion between like people who actually still waist train in like real proper corsets. Mm -hmm. And then people who are wearing those things, like if you put on one of those latex things, they're like expecting their body to automatically morph into something that looks like you've been wearing that you've been waist training for years and years and years, Mm -hmm. you know, and so like real waist trainers today are saying no, that's BS. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, that's all fakery by the Kardashians and whatnot. Like, like those little flimsy things are not making your body look right. like you've like, worn a corset your, all your stomach's life. not going to sweat slightly more than your arms and right. just be suddenly like super small and skinny right? exactly just not ridiculous. how it works yeah um yeah and i you know i have friends who refuse to wear underpants <laughs> and and i always thought i don't know i i always, they were always just like no f that i'm not doing like that just because everyone else wears does that and i was and well it's so you kudos know, to them i know i mean <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's it's, like, there's a lot of women who don't wear underpants when they work out. Um, right. And, that's, and, and like, if you, you know, any kind of like workout Facebook group or whatever, like I see these kind of conversations yeah. all the time and it's like 50, 50, like, oh my God, I'd never wear underwear when I'm working out. And then yeah. the other half. I know. Is like, I tried it once. I tried to not wear underwear while I was running and I had, I went for like a six mile run or something oh and it was a horrific experience. <laughs> I don't recommend it. I don't recommend but see, it. But half our listeners are going to be like, ew, you wore underwear while you're running. You're I so gross. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I think part of it is, yeah, what you're used to. I think another part of it is, you know, people's bodies are shaped differently. And so the mechanics just work differently right. for people. Like right. it's just, it's, you know, it's the same with, with working out too. Um, you know, certain, when you work out, like some people's, their body mechanics are just different. Mm-hmm. So they have to, you know, lift a weight a little bit differently or right. whatever to right. get the same effect that someone else's. Right. Um, it's just because we're all individual. We're all so different from each other. There we go. We should end on that um, note. All right. Well, thanks for listening. That's all that we have for you today. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, all of the um, social media apps. You can join our Facebook group at Dig History Pod Squad. Um, show notes and suggested readings are at uh, digpodcast.org. 
or transcripts if you need a transcript of today's show. Um, please rate and review us on iTunes. Um, it really helps get some exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast from. Yes, absolutely. Um, but we'll, we really appreciate it. So thanks for listening and have a good one. Bye. Colloquial. Ref- colloquially. <laughs> <sighs> um, like heads up. Heads up. Like heads. <laughs> I know how to say it, but for some reason I can't. <laughs> For the next millennium, the Byzantine Empire. <laughs> what? It's Byzantine. Byzantine. Oh. <laughs> Byzantine. <laughs> That's so southern of you. It was becoming more common for men to wear drawers under drawers. Drawers. <laughs> drawers. Uh. For centuries, Europeans had been wearing body liners for practical purposes. Body linens. What are oh, body liners? <laughs> like a panty liner. Panty liners. liners. <laughs> <laughs> Um...